It is the truth of life that we all must die. It is the universal journey that we all walk. It is the final destination. And yet, what happens when we arrive there is shrouded in mystery, as if fogged over by the ghosts of the underworld themselves. It is said in many ancient traditions that when we have breathed our final breath and the sight fades from our eyes, we will find ourselves on the banks of a metaphysical river or sea which separates the living from the dead. It is here that we will learn our fate. Tradition tells us of two paths in the afterlife. One, a heroic and Olympian leap into the celestial realms of the gods, for those who manage to safely cross that river. And the other, a path that reflects how most men live, in the shadows, untouched by divine light. And what about you? Will you bring a raft to bear you safely across the waters? Or will you attempt to swim against a current that can only wash you away into the darkness? Eva opens this chapter by remarking on the rather odd belief that we all have an immortal soul. While this is a common belief today, and one which fits in quite nicely with modern notions of egalitarianism, very little evidence of such a belief can be found in the world of tradition. Instead, traditional beliefs made a distinction between those exceptional few who achieved true immortality in the afterlife, and the majority who did not. In order to understand the nature of the soul, we must first understand the traditional teachings about the composition of a man. In addition to his physical body, he also has three essential principles that he is composed of. One principle is that of the ego, or the basic personality, which develops in parallel with the physical body, and is what most people generally identify with when they think of who they are as individuals. The principle of the shadow proceeds from the ego. It is the echo of the ego personality that lingers for a time after death, but is not immortal, and certainly not a soul. This shadow is the remnant of earthly cravings and desires and of false identifications. The principle of the daemon, or the double, is what one might be most likely to think of as a soul. The term daemon, sometimes also pronounced as demon, as it is used in this context does not have the connotation of something evil, but rather something naturalistic. Terms for this concept and the specific qualities attributed to it vary across cultures, but it is here being used generally to describe what we can think of as the animating and vital force of the physical body. It is a subtle body that interacts with the world in a way that typically eludes direct perception of it. The daemon is an emanation from the totem, and connected to the deepest forces of one's lineage, both of soul and of body. Similar in the way that a personified god emanates from the Newman, likewise are we all manifestations of the totem. We can think of the totem as being analogous to the soil from which all manner of different types of plants sprout and are nourished. The plants are not the same as the soil, but all have their roots in it and whether they be flowers, trees, grasses, or weeds, eventually return back to the soil when they wilt and die, to nourish the new seedlings that arise in the spring. The totem is the primordial metaphysical substance of a particular stock, family, or tribe, and we are each of us individual manifestations of it. Our totem lives in us, and we live in it the bio-spirit that pulses through our blood, 
Each individual that arises from the totem is simply a unique shuffling of the traits of their people. Upon death, for most of us, we cease to exist as individuals as we are drawn back into the ever-cycling stream of the subpersonal and generative power of the totem. On a deeper metaphysical level, we can understand this as the samsaric current as described in Buddhism, the churning well of aggregates born of craving and aversion. It is perhaps no coincidence that imagining this concept as a current or stream conjures up connotations with the metaphysical rivers of the underworld. The daemons, which Evola describes in his book, The Doctrine of Awakening, as entities of craving, arise out of the current and will be reabsorbed back into it upon their death, to be reshuffled and dealt out again to a new individual birth within that same lineage. Evola writes, According to esoteric teachings, at the death of the body, an ordinary person usually loses his or her personality, which was an illusory thing even while that person was alive. The person is then reduced to a shadow that is itself destined to be dissolved after a more or less lengthy period, culminating in what was called the second death. The essential vital principles of the deceased return to the totem, which is a primordial, perennial, and inexhaustible matter. Life will again proceed from this matter and assume other individual forms, all of which are subject to the same destiny. Thus, the majority of people become like sacrificial victims for the next generation, whose death releases personality to the ancestral forces and is used to nourish new life. Our daemons are, in a sense, simply on loan to us, connecting us in a primordial way to our totem and to our ancestors and descendants. We are them, and they are us. This is the moonlit path of the ancestors. In Sanskrit, this is called the Pitriyana, and the Upanishads describe this as a path for those who did not overcome their dominant desires and cravings in life and realize the true nature of their being. They may have been good people in life, but failed to achieve the liberation of their soul, and so they arrive at the door of the moon to stay in the world of the ancestors existing as food for the gods, and as long as their karma permits, and as long as their descendants observe the necessary rites to keep them in their astral bodies. When their karma is exhausted, it is said that they take rebirth according to their karma and their dominant cravings and aversions, but it is only these impersonal aggregates that will re-emerge from the totem, not their individual personality. This is, of course, in contrast with the more popular modern belief that we all have immortal souls and are all destined for a heavenly afterlife no matter how we lived. It is a common and comforting belief for many modern people to think that as long as one is not a truly evil person, there will be a place for them after death in the kingdom of God. However, for those who live only for today, pursuing their endless desires in a futile attempt to satisfy their eternal insufficiency through sensory indulgences or accumulation of material wealth, they will find in death a reflection of how they lived. It matters not that they may have committed no major sin if they failed to seek God and cultivate divine wisdom. They will face an afterlife that will mirror the insignificant and ephemeral nature of their lives because they have failed to make provisions for their inevitable voyage. Some ancient burial practices, such as those of the Germanic peoples, have involved ship burials, and others, such as those of the Greeks, require burying the dead with a coin for the psychopomp. In any case, the message is clear. Passage across the rivers of the underworld, whether it be the Styx, the Gyol, the Sanzu, the Vaitarna, or any other, is neither easy nor free. With neither boat nor coin, the only path available to the deceased is the path of the ancestors. He who has not worked in life to secure his passage across the river will die a second death by drowning. 
the waters of the samsaric totemic current will envelop him, and there is no escape. The fires of all his earthly passions will be quenched as he sinks into the deep. In the Egyptian tradition, those who followed the path of the ancestors and failed to achieve true immortality were referred to as twice dead. Not only did they experience the death of their physical body, but their non-corporeal selves would also die. Many funerary rites around the world were designed to help the deceased avoid the second death by giving them a boost to make the Olympian leap into divinity. The avoidance of this second death requires one to tread the path of the gods, which is the path taken by the heroes and the demigods. It is the path of those who use their lifetimes to become like gods themselves. There is a sacrificial aspect to this, and an initiatic character. In order to become like gods, we must sacrifice our lower natures to our higher natures, to produce the ontological change in being that renders a solar light from within. It is through such a process that one builds oneself an arc to bear their consciousness past the overwhelming rapids of the underworld river and into the celestial realms beyond. Allowing for a liberal interpretation of Evola and not being bogged down by semantics, one can visualize the mind, representing the individuated consciousness, needing the organism of the body to house it. Through various efforts at transcendence, the mind experiences glimpses of the spirit, representing that vital spark present in all living things. And through this contact is born what we can loosely call the soul. Then, upon the death of the physical body, the mind fused with the spirit, producing the soul, can make the journey through the afterlife with much surer footing than those soulless people who have not sought the divine knowledge while alive, and therefore are woefully unequipped to identify the correct path in the afterlife, overwhelmed as they would be with confusion and fear by the abrupt change in the state of their consciousness which for most profane people, as Evola describes in the Yoga of Power, is accompanied by intense emotions, a smoke that obscures the mind from within, and a swoon into unconsciousness. This development of a true eternal soul is what all religious traditions aim to help their devotees accomplish in some way or another. The ancient Egyptians believed that this incorruptible and immortal soul, which they called Sahu, was fashioned out of the daemon in a way, as the daemon was considered one's personal link with the gods, and was seen as trying to guide the person towards divine wisdom, towards higher consciousness, and towards living in harmony with Maat, or the natural cosmic order. Through uniting the daemon, or the Ka, the person's vital essence, with their individuated consciousness, or Ba, via the performance of rites, the Sahu was created as a spiritual body that would replace the physical body and could stand on its own two feet in the supernatural realms of the afterlife. In the Gnostic traditions, which have some overlap with Kabbalistic beliefs, we find an esoteric interpretation of the biblical story of the Ark, in which we read of Noah who was instructed by God to build a boat, an Ark, to withstand the flood. In fact, the Hebrew word from which Ark was translated is Teba, which does not mean boat, but rather a box, a casing, or a hull. In the Latin translations of the Bible, this became Arca, which also means a chest, the trunk of the human body, or a coffin, and is related to our modern word arcane, meaning secret. In the Bible, we find several types of arcs, all of which are intended to protect something sacred. In some Gnostic and Kabbalistic teachings, the ark represents either the physical body or the esoteric secret sciences of the soul, 
and Noah represents the seed of the soul, the true nature of our psyche, our consciousness in its pure and radiant unblemished form, and the development of the soul is represented by Noah's three sons, a development which is achieved by a second birth, that is, initiation or spiritual enlightenment or liberation. In 1 Corinthians it is written, Know ye not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which ye have of God, and ye are not your own. Noah was instructed to leave behind all those who were wicked to be washed away in the flood as he took refuge in his ark. When we think of the ark as our physical bodies and we see our bodies as temples of God, it becomes clear that in order for us to protect our souls we must be pure of body and mind, leaving behind our base material passions and transmuting our animal urges into higher virtues. When we think of the Ark as a hermetically sealed vessel that represents wisdom, it becomes clear that we must discover the secrets of the self-realization of our own being. Traditionally, such secrets would have been imparted through the initiatic chain, although some modern paths attempt to convey these teachings in other ways. For many Gnostics, resurrection was a spiritual rather than physical resurrection and referred to the awakening of the soul to the Spirit of God, and that those who experienced this resurrection would achieve union with God and escape the samsaric cycle, instead making the Olympian leap into the divine realms after death. In the Gnostic Gospel of Philip it is said, People who say they will first die and then arise are mistaken. If they do not first receive resurrection while they are alive, once they have died, they will receive nothing. Thus one must assemble an ark, a resurrection body. Such a body is formed out of the daemon capable of housing consciousness through the crisis of death, in which one will experience the dissolution of their ego and have their true self stripped naked under the piercing glare of divine light. In order to transform the daemon into an immortal body, one must have achieved a high degree of transcendent knowledge, spiritual virility, and solar glory, and in so doing, create an ark, a body of glory that can carry you across the river. This is the currency with which we must pay the ferryman. We build this vessel through our steady effort to transcend our normal existence, by developing knowledge of self and soul, and then using this perception to apprehend the divine. The path of the gods is also known as the solar path, or Zeus's path, intended to lead one to the door of the sun and into the luminous realm of the deities, who themselves once tread a solar path, which is reenacted by the priests through the sacred rites. In some texts of ancient Egypt and Mesopotamia, two civilizations born on the banks of numinous rivers, it is suggested that only the sun god can traverse the waters between life and death, and in other stories that resurrection from death can only be facilitated by the sun god. The cyclical pattern of the rising and setting of the sun reflected the journey of the deceased and the direction of travel that could lead to a return to life. Consider in this context the solar nature of the king, as well as the similar regal and luminous nature created in an individual who has undergone initiation and who participates in the rites. When we become solar, like a god, we too have the ability not only to safely traverse the rivers of the underworld and cross into the celestial realms, but we are, in a sense, resurrected. We avoid the second death, achieving a supernatural life. Death on the path of the gods is not death at all, but everlasting life. In his book, The Yoga of Power, Evola writes, It is necessary first to learn the art of dying. 
The tired, tamasic attitude that overwhelms people before they fall asleep is extremely deleterious, and so is the anguished, resigned attitude with which most people take leave of this world. Indomitable faith combined with supreme serenity of the mind are indispensable at the moment of death. Indeed, we no longer live in an age where the moribund face death with dignity, nobility, or even calm acceptance. But instead, our contemporary worldly culture stokes fear of death and disease, and an obsession with prolonging the inevitable visit from the Reaper, no matter how unnaturally. And yet, despite these fears, so few still fail to prepare for the inevitable journey to the final destination that none of us can avoid. We are conditioned by the secular attitude towards death to fear it. To the atheist, death is the physical process of the termination of the organism, and consciousness is something that arises purely as a result of material processes, and therefore there can be no such thing as an eternal soul. For those who are destined to return to the totem, this belief is not altogether inappropriate, and the fear of death that arises in the atheist over the impending loss of their sense of self is also a reasonable fear for one who is on the path of the ancestors. It is true that when we die, we will not be able to hold on to our ego personality, regardless of what path we take in the afterlife. The question then becomes one of whether or not you have cultivated a transcendent self that is greater than the ego. For it is this transcendent self that has the capacity to achieve an Olympian immortality. In some ancient traditions, death was seen as a fulfillment, a culmination, or a triumph if one had lived in a way that bestowed immortality. The day of death was considered a day of birth. Born into the immortal realms of the gods, the deceased hailed as a hero to be worshipped evermore as divine. The elderly who had lived nobly, who had succeeded in sacrificing their lower natures to their higher, who were possessed of great wisdom, who had cultivated a spiritual virility and a solar nature, and who had knowledge of the self, were seen as manifesting the divine force that would be fully liberated upon their death. In the context of the two paths in the afterlife, we again see the recurring theme of the doctrine of the two natures, one Uranian and solar, the other telluric and lunar. Evelyn notes that this produces two distinct and sometimes opposing types of rite and cult, and he remarks that a civilization's degree of faithfulness to tradition is determined by the degree of the predominance of the Uranian and solar cult rites and deities over the telluric and lunar types. Evola says, A regal or aristocratic tradition arises wherever there is dominion over the totems, and not dominion of the totems, and wherever the bond is inverted and the deep forces of the stock are given a super-biological orientation by supernatural principle in the direction of an Olympian victory and immortality. That is to say, rather than worshipping the Ketonic totemic forces, those forces must be consciously directed in the service of a higher transcendent goal. Where there is dominion over the totem in this way, a society establishes a vertical, hierarchical, and regal orientation and a solar cult. But where the collective and infernal forces of the totem are allowed to dominate over man, a type of inferior cult forms in which attempts are made to placate and propitiate the forces of the totem. Evola says this extreme degeneration of higher traditional forms of spirituality are an extension of the way of being of those who have no rights at all, no transcendent connection to a divine lineage, no sacred mysteries to light the way to a second birth, 
but rather only customs and beliefs of a superstitious and promiscuous nature that reflect a lunar and plebeian way of living. It was the task of the patriciate to free their fellow men from the dominion of the totems, to strengthen them spiritually and set them on a heroic path by which they would have a chance to walk the path of the gods. When a civilization persevered in the solar cults and adhered to the sacred rites, the path of the ancestors was barred. But once the rites became neglected, humanity degenerated into what we now think of as primitive cults, in which the inferior power of the totem arose supreme. It is said that those who neglect the rites cannot escape hell, both in the sense of a way of being in this life and a destiny in the next. Evelo writes, These two paths, one bright and the other dark, are considered eternal in the universe. In the former, man goes out and then comes back. In the latter, he keeps on returning. The first path, leading to Brahman, namely to the unconditioned state, is analogically associated with fire, light, the day, and the six months of the solar ascent of the year. It leads to the region of thunderbolts located beyond the door of the sun. The second path is related to smoke, night, and the six months of the sun's descent leads to the moon, which is the symbol of the principle of change and of becoming and which is manifested here as the principle regulating the cycle of finite beings who continuously come and go in many ephemeral incarnations of the ancestral forces. We exist in our earthly lives upon the intersection of two axes, the vertical axis of that which is spiritual and timeless, and the horizontal axis of the physical world, bound as it is by the laws of matter and linear time. Our task is to master this cross upon which we are hung, to navigate this duality in order to experience connection with the divine. Evola writes in his Synthesis of the Doctrine of the Races that those who choose the path of darkness, the southern path, the path of the ancestors, are passing on to others the task for which they were inadequate. They may have fulfilled their earthly duty on the horizontal axis of assuring the continuation of their genetic lineage, but have failed to fulfill their spiritual duty on the vertical axis by achieving the heroic redemption of their line. When a person achieves an Olympian immortality, their entire family line is also immortalized through that individual, as the family totem is now eternally preserved through that individual's unique manifestation of the totem. The dissolved souls of the ancestors are manifested and perpetuated in those who become deified. In some traditions, it is believed that our daemons want us to walk the path of the gods, to transform our daemons into proper, indissoluble, eternal souls, so that they can be free of the impersonal current of the totem. The heroic triumph of such an individual bestows a sacred legacy on the generations who come after, if they continue to reenact and renew the right of their divine ancestor, the father of their line. The path of the gods is the goal of the differentiated man. It won't be technology or materialistic science that unlocks the divine, but through inner work of a vertical effort, that is, oriented upwards to the higher realms. It is said in the Upanishads that truth alone wins the self, and it is by truth that the path of the gods is laid out. The type of regeneration that occurs with the path of the ancestors should not be imagined as a reunion with forefathers, but rather as a dissolution into the primordial energy, a fragmentation of the self that never blossomed into something fully realized, instead fading back into the current, 
memories and personality splintered and reconstituted in the ancestral fires. The vast majority of humanity is destined for this eternal churning. This is why holy men from countless religions speak of the urgency of our earthly predicament, because most cannot escape from the grasp of this endless insufficiency, in part because they are not aware of what is at stake, lulled to sleep by egalitarian dreams and the promise of spiritual participation awards. This work is critical, and time is an illusion. The journey must begin immediately. To those cynical voices that ask, why bother, we answer, because we cannot do any less, for this is our life. There can be no compromises. There can be no denouement. This is your time. It is said that the gods view it as immensely difficult to be born as a man, but also a great opportunity. We are a bridge somewhere between the savage beast and the divine god, over an abyss of humanity lost in craving and clamoring for something that cannot ever be satisfied. We do not know exactly what measure of effort is required, and so we are compelled to move to the goal with all that we can muster. The Norsemen believed that those who die on the battlefield achieve fulfillment in Valhalla, and so they knew the liberating heroism of the Kshatriyas, the Templar Knights, the Sikhs of Sirhind, the Sword of Arjuna, the Secret of the Samurai, the Shaolin Warriors, the Lama Pai, Naga Babas, and the ancient fighting monks of Dharma Marga. Ascetic warriors who do not fear death, but rather see it as a great victory. It is the same heroic advantage that a great 20th century military general referred to when he said, Give me an army of men prepared to die, and I will defeat any army of men who are merely prepared to kill because when a warrior faces death with the promise of life in his heart, and when his soul is set afire by the collective will of his forefathers, then eternity beckons him to arise, to conquer his fears, to let go of his base desires, and to remember his name. Not in this world, but his eternal name as it is written in the heavens, his astral symbol, the God he was born in the image of. And it is for the same reason that the language of the ascetic monk matches that of the warrior, moving with a fighter's grace, strong like a mountain, conquering and mastering inner forces that are like the chaos of the outer world. Because to become a hero, when all appears lost, when no easy path exists, is to draw upon the fighter within you, to orient towards your own light to set upon a vision that lifts your eyes and begets strength and confidence and acts as a catalyst for superhuman transformation. One day we must all meet on the banks of that mystical river, and at that moment of judgment we will be glad that we have made provisions for the crossing, that we have lived an integral life, seeking knowledge of the divine and striving with heroic effort, resisting despair, and always following the light, no matter how oppressive the darkness becomes. Free your ancestors from their totemic burden, lift yourself into the celestial kingdom, and become who you were born to be.
into the celestial kingdom and become who you were born to be. in my dying time.